morning, everybody. Glad to have everybody here. If you're a guest with us, especially glad to have you present with us at Risen Church for our worship service this morning. Uh, if, if you uh, have, haven't noticed already, our trustees were hard at work this week and uh, so thankful for, uh, for the guys that came out and made this happen. They redid our, our back wall and just kind of uh, changed it up a little bit to give us a new look. And so I'm so thankful for the hours that they put in and the, the sweat that they bore on this stage to, to make it happen. And uh, so thankful for them and, and for the, the guys that painted the doors and a lot of good work, hard work went into that. So we appreciate that. Thank you guys. <clears throat> for making that happen. Uh, hopefully, it'll make me look better somewhat to you. I don't know. I just hope that it'll have some positive effect. Uh, a couple things that I do want to bring up as we begin this morning. Uh, first of all, if you have your bulletin inside that, there's message notes. Uh, your message notes have um, James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12 on those, which is a lot of verses. I'm actually only going to preach 7 and 8 today. If you want an updated version of your message notes. I have something new that we haven't done before, but I want to try it out on you today. If you have the YouVersion Bible app on your phone or device, uh, YouVersion Bible app, they have this, this special little uh, uh, part of it where if you go to that app and you, you know, it's got the Holy Bible, the YouVersion Bible app, it only works with that, that certain app. It's a great app. But if you go to the, uh, once you start it up here, if you go to the More tab, if it starts up, if you go to the More tab, you can click on events. So go to more, click events, and then it should, by your location, recognize that Risen Church has, uh, they're live right now. And inside that, you have message notes, the verses we're going to be using, some of the points I'll be using. You can follow along. You can actually make uh, add notes in that if you want to take notes into that, and then you can save it for your viewing pleasure later, or if you want to remind yourself of something. So just something that we're doing to try to, to help out. I know that's not for everybody, but for some people, maybe it'll be something that you can uh, watch and enjoy. So uh, go to the More tab in your YouVersion Bible app, select Events, and then select, or, uh, select Risen Church, or you can search Risen Church, and it'll probably come up there. But just something to help you guys out there. Uh, last thing before we just jump into the Word today is uh, inside your bulletin, there's also a connection card. Just take a second to fill that out today, rip that off, and drop it in the offering plate uh, that will be passed at the end of the service. We appreciate it. Okay, so I do have to start off this morning's message with somewhat of an apology. I feel like, um, as I was going throughout the week last week, I feel like I dropped the ball in, in one particular instance. Uh, last week we talked about James 5, 1 through 6, and he talks about the rich oppressors and these people who are rich, which we classified as having more than you need. And they were, they were storing up their wealth, and they were cheating their laborers, and they were just living for themselves. They were living a self-indulgent lifestyle. And the big gist of the message last week was that we need to be generous. If we have more than we need, we need to be generous with others. We don't need to, to store up, but we need to give. We don't need to cheat others. We need to be fair. We don't need to live for self, but we need to live for others as well. And so the big gist was generosity. We need to be a generous people, right? And uh, what I failed to mention was the most important thing is, is just to tie it all back into why we should be generous, why we should live a generous life, why we should be generous with what we have. We should be generous because we've experienced the most extreme generosity that's ever been given, and that is the generosity that Jesus Christ would give up himself for us. And so we are generous because we've experienced generosity that is why we give. That is why we share. That is why we are generous towards others, because we've experienced that generosity. We know the, the impact that it can make. We are generous because Christ is generous. And uh, I failed to mention that last week, and it was eating at me all week, so I wanted to share it with you today. Hopefully it's not too late. Uh, but here's what we want to do this week. We want to go from the evil, the rich oppressors uh, that we were talking about last week, and then James kind of switches. <clears throat> And he begins talking about the people who are being oppressed, these righteous people who are being oppressed. These people are facing persecution, uncertain and frustrating circumstances within their lives. And so James turns his attention to them because these are people that are waiting for Christ to return. And they can't wait for him to get here. They're anxious for him to get here. 
And so James turns his attention to them. And so if you have your Bibles or you're reading on the app or your sermon notes or on the screen, there's several places you can read the scripture along with me. It's in James chapter 5. We're going to read verses 7 and 8 today. 7 and 8. <clears throat> James says, Be patient, therefore, brothers. And so that's how we know he says brothers. He's not talking to his earthly brothers. That's how we know he's talking to the church because he's calling them brothers. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're family of God. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Patience. He says it twice in there that we should be patient. I think he wants us to, to cone in on that, right? To understand. That's the, the gist of what he's talking about is that we need to be patient. Now, there's kind of a running joke in Christian circles about patience. And you've probably heard this before. They say, uh, don't ever pray for patience. Have you heard somebody say that? Don't, or maybe you've said it. Don't pray for patience. Why do they say that? Because they say whenever you pray for patience, then God will test your patience. And that's how you'll increase in your patience is you'll be put in these situations which really test your patience. And so like when you pray for patience, you'll find yourself surrounded by the most annoying people that you've ever met, right? When you pray for patience, you'll find yourself uh, broke down on the side of the road when you're already late for an appointment. When you, when you pray for patience, you'll find yourself at the Walmart cashier register, stuck behind the, the person with two carts, 45 coupons, and then she wants to pay with a check, and you're just like, please, hurry. Uh, when you pray for patience, these things happen. No offense to those of you who pay with a check or coupons or have two carts. Uh, no offense at all. When you pray for patience, you get put in situations, you know, that test your patience. Worst of all, you get put in a situation like this. It's 3 o'clock. You're trying to pick up your kid from Southwest Elementary. <laughs> you find yourself backed up at the intersection, waiting for what seems like hours. That's the true test of patience. I must have been praying for patience last week uh, because uh, I had that that. that joyous experience. Now, I don't know if there's any biblical backing to the fact that if you pray for patience, God will put you in situations that test your patience, but it just seems to happen that way. And so today we're going to talk for a few minutes about patience, but not just any patience. We're talking about patience toward something, something special, something that we have to look forward to. And those are the situations where it's uh, most difficult to be patient, right? When you're looking forward to something, when you're excited about something, it becomes difficult for us to be patient. Now, patience is one of the more difficult things in our society for us to grasp because we live in a society that is obsessed with instant gratification, right? We want our news and we want it now. So we don't wait until six o'clock news comes on. Uh, we'll get on our, our phones or the computer or the device and we'll check Facebook or Twitter or wherever else. We'll get the news immediately before it ever even is broadcasted. Uh, we don't want things later. We want them now. And I think that's part of the uh, appeal to some people of this health, wealth, and prosperity message that some pastors preach, that you'll get your reward now if you're faithful to Christ. Uh, but that's not the message of the Bible, and that's not the message that Jesus shares or James shares or Paul shares, and it's certainly not the message that they experience themselves with their own life. But that's the appeal of it for people, that I can have my reward right now that I don't have to wait until Jesus returns to receive my reward, but I can be rewarded now. But the farmer, he talks about the farmer. The farmer doesn't get his reward the day he plants, does he? No, it's a test of patience. To be patient is this, is to be of long spirit, not to lose heart. And so it's important for the farmer to not lose heart. Between the time that he plants in the time that he harvests. He's got to stay on it. He's got to stay vigilant. Now, admittedly, I got to tell you, I'm not a farmer. And so I'm going to be trying to talk about farming here. I did a little research online. I also talked to a farmer. I'm not a farmer, okay? The closest thing I came to farming was working at Bob Evans, you know? <laughs> down, but down on the farm, that's the closest I came to it. But uh, 
But I'm not a farmer, so I tried to ask around, and I did some research specifically on what it means to uh, farm in the Middle East, in this time, in this culture where James was at, because they were living in a very agricultural society. I mean, even more so than what we live in right now, which uh, we, we in, this, in this area probably can understand this parallel a little better than some others. Um, but the big idea that James wants to share with us today is not just to be patient, but to be patient until Jesus returns. That's what we're being patient for, the return of Christ our King. That's what we're anticipating and looking forward to, and we should be excited about, but we should be patient until then. So let's dig into this passage of Scripture a little bit. Let's look at uh, James 5-7 one more time. Uh, Josh, if you would just flip back up. We're going to look at 5-7 real quick. I want to read it again, and then we're going to dig into this, this kind of uh, a parallel that he makes between farming and us waiting for Christ. He says this, he says, be patient, therefore, brothers, until what? Until the coming of the Lord. That's what we're waiting for. And he says, see how the farmer, what's the farmer do? The farmer waits. What's he wait for? He waits for his reward and the precious fruit of the earth. He waits for the harvest and he's patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. Now, in the, in the area that, that James was writing in, they had kind of a different season than we do here. You know, we plant in the spring and we harvest in the fall. And, and where James is talking about here in the Palestine environment, they would, be, they would be planting in the fall and they would harvest then in the spring. And so in this time, they had this, this early rain that came. And this early rain would, would come, uh, the autumn rains occurred right before sowing, and the spring rains right before harvest. And so it was so important for these rains to occur because the first one would soften up the ground and prepare it for the uh, seeds to be sown. And then the second one then would come and it would uh, fill in the crops and it would help them mature and complete the maturation process. And so the farmer's life then and even now was a 100% waiting game. There's nothing that, that he could do to make the, the harvest come sooner. He had to, he had to wait. He had to, to let it play out. So how does a farmer display patience? Let me name a few ways that a farmer displays patience for you today. Uh, number one, he waits a long time, right? He waits a long time. But he doesn't wait idly. He waits working all the while. He stays after it. He waits depending on things that are out of his own power. He, he depends on the rain. He depends on the weather, things that are out of his control. He waits despite changing circumstances, despite many uncertainties that he may face. He waits. He waits, and he's encouraged as he waits by the value of the harvest. He waits, encouraged by the work of the harvest, by the work of others. He waits because really, honestly, let's talk about it. He has no other option. He waits because it does no good to give up. And so let's talk about this, and how does it apply to us? Okay, I'm not a farmer. Many of you may not be farmers. But how does this apply to us? How does this apply to the return of Christ? Well, like a farmer can't rush the rain. He can't rush the harvest. He can't say, I got bills to pay, so I need to harvest now, and I can't wait till fall. He's got to wait for it. We can't make Jesus show up sooner. There's nothing that you can do, there's nothing that I can do that is going to rush Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, to come back sooner than we want. We can't say, Jesus, things are getting bad. I need you to come now. And he's going to come when he wants to come. He's going to come when it's time for him to come. We can't rush his coming. But like the farmer anticipates the harvest, we have to anticipate the return of Christ. We have to be ready for it. We have to be looking forward to it. We have to be preparing for it. We have to understand that as followers of Christ, at that time, at that moment when Christ returns, that is when we will be rewarded for our faithfulness to Christ. A farmer doesn't reap his reward until harvest, but he looks forward to harvest, to reap that reward. What he has worked so hard for, not only in sowing, but all the time after that. We have to understand that as believers, as followers of Christ, our true reward will not come until Christ returns, and we must keep our eyes on that. We must keep our eyes on the fact that that is when our return will come. That is when our reward will come, when Christ returns. 
But there are things that we can do today, right now, that ensure that when Jesus returns, the harvest will be plentiful. And that's what we want as a followers of Christ, as a local church. We want the harvest to be plentiful. We want when Jesus returns, as many people as possible to be called home to heaven to experience the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. This illustration of a farmer, it reminds us of some things. It reminds us that faith involves trusting God in what we cannot control. And there's plenty of elements in this world that, guess what? We cannot control them. We can't change them, can't do anything about them. But the farmer also honors God by working faithfully in what he can control. And so while there's plenty of things that are out of our control, like when Jesus will come back, and how other people treat us. We can't control those things. What we can control, we have to be faithful in. We have to honor God with the things that we can control. And so, while we should be patient until Jesus returns, I think one of the things that we learn from the farmer and from this scripture here is that being patient doesn't mean inactivity. So, just because we're patient doesn't mean we're being lazy. Just because we're being patient and waiting for Christ, and I'm just it doesn't mean we're just gonna chill, sit back, and let whatever happens, happens in our world, because we know we're good, because I know I'm taken care of. Patience doesn't mean inactivity. Patience doesn't mean laziness. Both the Christian and the farmer must live by faith, looking to the future for the reward of our labor, but we must faithfully work until that day. We must faithfully work until his return we got to stay after it because our goal is that we're not the only ones, right? Our goal is that, that thousands more, that maybe just one more or, or hundreds of thousands more might know Christ because we were faithful in what we did in the meantime. A farmer can't rush the process, but he can't sit back and take the summer off either. We can't rush the process, but, but guys, we can't sit back and do nothing. While millions, and if we're honest in the world, you know, billions of people enter into a Christless eternity, we must be active. There's work to do for you and for I to ensure that when Christ returns, there is a bountiful harvest. When Christ returns, we, the followers of Christ, will be raptured up to heaven. But don't you know that until that day comes, We've got work to do. <clears throat> Man, we got work to do. Watch the news. We got work to do. Look at your Facebook. We got work to do. You know what I mean? Look, at, look around your workplace. We got work to do. You know? turn, turn to your left or to your right. You know, we got work to do, right? We got work to do, church. We got work to do in here. We got work to do out there. We got work to do. We got to be about the Lord's work. And as followers of Christ, you and I should be living and breathing examples of what it means to follow Christ. And we must be willing and able to share the good news, the the gospel message that Jesus Christ tasted death so that other people might live. We got to share the the hope and the, the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. Like, I don't want to step on toes because I'm not the best of it, but, but when is the last time that you shared the gospel with somebody? When is the last time that you, you like, sat down and out of love with somebody you had a relationship with, you just looked at him and you said, like, what, do you, what do you think about Jesus? Let me tell you how Jesus has is, is impacted my life. I'd just like to, I mean, just for a few minutes to share with you and, and just in love share the message that Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth. He died a sinner's death because we are sinners so that we wouldn't have to face that punishment. And then he rose again on the third day. And because of that, we can repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and we can find forgiveness and hope in him. When is the last time that we talk to somebody one-on-one about that? When is the last time that we even looked for an opportunity to do that? That's the work that we have to do. The work of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. So that these people, not for no reason, but so that these people might find eternal life in him. 
so that these people might find forgiveness and hope that this world is not the end, that they might also anticipate, like you and I, the return of Christ, at which time we'll receive our full reward. That's the good news, that there's forgiveness of our sins, guys, that none of us are perfect. We're all just beggars telling another beggar where we got some bread at. We're all just sinners telling other sinners where you can find forgiveness and hope in Jesus Christ. We're all messed up. We all make mistakes. But not all of us know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's where we come in as the church, as followers of Christ, to carry on that mission, that responsibility to share Christ with the world. We can't sit on our, on our duff and just expect that the harvest is going to be great. We can't sit down and just wait till Jesus comes back. We've got to be active with our faith. We've got to live it out. We've got to share it. We've got to work. Now, uh, Jesus, like I said, lived in a very agricultural society. I want to share like another passage, and this is bouncing off of James, and we'll get back to James in just a second. But I thought it was very fitting considering this, this topic here. But in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 38, Jesus, he shares with us uh, a little bit about the harvest. He talks about the harvest again, because remember, agricultural society, he's trying to make this make sense to them. He wants them to connect with it, so he's using these examples. So it says this. It says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, and he was teaching in their synagogues, and he was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and he was healing every disease and affliction. Verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he, he looks at his disciples, and he says this. To his disciples. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's go to 36 one, one more time. Let's look at 36 one more time. We, I want you to understand. I want you to, to, to put yourself in Jesus' shoes. Understand the feelings that he's got going on here. He saw the crowds, okay, and he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What are sheep without a shepherd? I mean, they are, they're helpless and hopeless. Like, they're bound to get lost, bound to get hurt, bound to get attacked by a wolf. You know, they're defenseless, you know what I mean? Bound to get made into a T-shirt. Sheep without a shepherd, not a good thing, right? But then Jesus says, he looks at his disciples because he's got compassion on these people. He feels bad for them. He's like, these people are wandering around, slipping into every kind of sin and all kind of dangerous situations, and their, their eternity is what he's concerned about. Their eternity is in danger. And so he's compassion on them, and he's like, you guys, they're like sheep without a shepherd. You guys need to go. You guys need to, to go out to them. You, you need to be the witnesses to them. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus uses the same illustration, talking about the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few, and he sends out 72 people. He says, send out 72 guys, and this is what he says to them. He says, go on your way. Behold, I am sending you out. As followers of Christ, we are sent out. Jesus says, the, the minute that you declared your allegiance to Christ, the minute that you said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, and I want to live for you, is the moment that Jesus sent you out. He called you in, and then he sent you out. You've accepted my grace, now go share it, right? You, 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 know what it, you know what life's about now? Go tell other people. You've experienced my grace, share that grace. You've experienced my love, share that love. Live like you believe it, because there are people out there that are like sheep without a shepherd. They got no hope. They got no chance of survival. They're out there, and they're, they're living, and they're eating, and they're feeling good. But when the wolf comes, it's going, be, it's going to be too late. So you need to go. You need to share the good news with them. And we are to, to carry out that message. Me and you, we're to live, breathe, and share the gospel. We're to, to serve, to live, to give, and to speak selflessly. That's, that's the mission of Christ, is to go out, to live like we believe it, to talk like we believe it, to share with other people the hope that is in Jesus Christ. We must be patient 
until he returns, but we're not lazy. Oh, no. (laughs) Yes, we must wait. But no, we do not do nothing while we wait. We're active. We're on a mission. We're, We're out and about getting after it. Because there are people that need Jesus Christ. So we trust God with what we can't control, but we honor God with what we can control. The things that we can do, we honor God in them. James 5, 8. Let's look at this. Jump back to James. He says, you also be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, when he says at hand, what he's he's saying, and, and you guys know this, but he's saying it's near it's close, it's coming soon. I'm going to reference that later, so, so hold on to that. It's near, it's close, it's coming soon. It's coming soon, it's at hand. So he says for us to establish our hearts. What does it mean to establish our hearts? What he's telling us is that you and I, we need to, to set our hearts firmly on something. So we set our hearts on a lot of different things, but he's saying you need to set your heart firmly on what? On the return of Christ. That's where we're setting our our heart, our focus, our mind is on the return of Christ. Set our minds on it. Now think of all the things that we set our our hearts on. What do we we set our hearts on? We set our our hearts, you know, think of right now, we think we set our hearts on gold medals, right? That's one thing we set our hearts on. Gold medals and fame and friendships and marriage and successful kids and big houses and all these great things that we can achieve. We set our hearts on all these things, hoping to achieve these things. But then we get them, and then, and then what? And then what's next? Nothing on this earth, guys. Nothing on this earth can give you, will fulfill you, like you'll be fulfilled the day that Christ returns. Like you think you've experienced joy now. You think that you felt like my life is complete now. You think that you've had those moments maybe. Maybe not forever, but you had those moments where you feel like, I've made it, this is it, life is awesome, life's the best, I've accomplished my dreams, this is so great. Nothing you've experienced will fulfill you. Like you'll be fulfilled the day that Christ returns. When you see your Savior, when you know that that everything that you've worked for, everything that you've believed, everything that you've sacrificed for, it was not for no reason. It was not for not. It was for a purpose. And you know that day. While you have doubts today, you'll know that day. That Christ is real. That Christ is back. And your eternity is secure in him. Nothing this world can give you will fulfill you like Jesus Christ will fulfill you. It's will be the greatest reward we've ever received. It'll be greater than everything else that you've ever achieved. Everything else you've ever achieved in your whole life will be overshadowed in that moment. Overshadow is an understatement. It'll be obliterated in that moment, standing underneath the return of Jesus Christ. Christ. It will be the highlight of your life. So much so that the rest of eternity, nothing else will have ever mattered more than that day you saw Christ face to face and he called you home and said, well done, good and faithful servant. Nothing matters more. And that is what we should be living in anticipation of. That is what we should set our hearts on. Our hearts should be established on what? For the coming of the Lord is at hand. So we set our hearts on that. We live in anticipation of that. We're waiting patiently, but we're not waiting lazily. We're getting after it because there's work to be done. And here's what happens. What happens when we set our hearts on the return of Christ is our perspective gets changed, right? Whenever something takes uh, a prominent place in your life, it changes how you view the other things below it, right? It, everything else kind of, you know, when, it, when something takes top priority, nothing else can be top priority, right? Everything else has got to shift around, it's got to shift down, it's got to move. 
And so when we establish our hearts, not on the things of this world, but when we establish our hearts on the return of Christ, then everything else, everything else changes. It changes how we view things. It changes how you view the world. Uh, simply, it changes things in, in two ways. It changes how you view it changes how you view time. Because if our hearts are set on the return of Christ, we, we view time as precious. Like every moment matters. Like there, there's nothing that we can take for granted. Like we've got to the moment that we're living in. Understanding that Christ could come back now. He could come back tomorrow. He could come back 50 years from now, but the return of Christ is imminent. And so we live as if we believe it. We got to use our time wisely. We don't waste it. We establish our priorities and how we use our time based on that. On this idea that time is precious, that this may be the last opportunity I get to share the gospel with them. This may be the last time. This may be the only time they hear the gospel. And so while I'm waiting patiently for the return of Christ, I'm not being lazy. I'm taking advantage of this time that God has given us. It's a gift to us that we'd have this time to be at work for the Lord. So we view time as, as precious, and it also changes how we view people. Because every person is precious in the eyes of the Lord. Now listen, they may not always be precious to us, right? When they're, when they're hurting you, when they're causing you frustration or pain, they may not feel real precious to you, right? But we understand that deep inside every person, there's a soul that is precious to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that soul is what is precious, and that is what we must care for. And so even though they've hurt you, and they've offended you, and they've caused you uh, and inflicted great pain on you, we still, we still pray for them. We still, we still hope that even if we are unable at this moment to, to forgive, to move on, even if we are unable at this moment to, to bring ourselves and humble ourselves enough to share the gospel with them, that somebody would until that day comes when we have worked up the courage and the understanding to do so. But when we set our hearts on the return of Christ, then we want to. We want to see as many people enter the gates of heaven upon the return of Christ as possible. And so we get after it. We work. Guys, we've got change. to change our perspective. I mean, it, go, it kind of goes hand in hand with what we talked about last week. You know, we talked about these rich oppressors, and they're, what are they doing? They're storing up, and they're, they're cheating others, and they're living their self-indulgent lives. And that's, that's because their perspective is all off. Because they're not anticipating the return of Christ. They're not looking forward to it. They don't see that as their great reward. What do they see as their reward? Right here, right now. And for those people, unfortunately, that don't know Christ, this life is as good as it's going to get. I don't know about you, but that doesn't give me much hope. Like, this life is as good as it's going to get for me. Like, I feel like my life's pretty good. But, like, I know it's, it's nothing. It pales in comparison to what my eternity is going to be like. So we, we have to let our perspective be, be altered by setting our hearts upon the return of Christ. We talked about a few weeks ago, you know, our God is a God who is not willing to let any perish. And so we serve that God that is not willing to let any perish, and that we as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, should also not be willing to let any perish. <clears throat> I want to challenge you this week to spend some time. I want to challenge you to spend some time looking at uh, four books of the Bible, okay? You want to know what it looks like to live with this perspective on life? Uh, to live with this perspective that time is precious and that people are precious? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, just four books. First four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read those four books, and, and if you would pay attention to one of the main characters named Jesus. And I want you to pay attention to, to his life, uh, not just how he lives, but pay attention to this. Pay attention to how Jesus values time. Pay attention to his schedule and, and how he spent. And then pay attention to how he values people, not just his own people, but, but all different people. Pay attention to how Jesus values time and how he values people. And then pay attention to, to what happens 
when, when people intersect with his time, when he's interrupted by people and it messes up his schedule. Pay attention to what Jesus does then when a, he's walking through the crowd and a woman grabs his robe. Pay attention to when he's walking around and there's a man in the tree just trying to get a peek at him. Pay attention to what Jesus does when a, when a man is he's teaching a crowd and a man drops through the roof. And Jesus viewed people, all people, as precious souls in need of a Savior. And he was that. He was the Savior for them. And he is that for us and for the world that we live in today. And church, that's, that's the word that we need to be declaring. That we know a Savior. If you want to know what it, lives, it looks like to live with that perspective, we need to, to read, the, read those stories. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read through them over and over again. Imitate him. Implement him into your life. Change your life and orient your life around living like Jesus Christ. And that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. That's, that's, that's what it is. To be a Christian means to be Christ-like. And so until the day that Jesus returns, our goal is simply this. Let's not make it complicated. Our goal is to become as much like Christ as possible. Will we ever be fully Christ-like? No. None of us will ever be there. We'll never reach perfection. But until the day he returns, we must be pursuing a life that glorifies and honors and resembles Christ. We must be patient. Be patient. But that doesn't mean we're inactive, guys. It means we're getting after it every day. This week, you're going to have opportunities. It's just, I'm not, I'm not a prophet. I'm not predicting anything here. I'm just telling you, you're going to have opportunities to share the gospel. Because you're going to, unless you're going to go home and lock yourself in the house and never get out, uh, you're going to inter intersect your life with other people. And some people are going to interrupt your schedule, and some people are going to pop in, and some people, uh, you may interrupt their schedule. But you're going to have opportunities to share the gospel. I want to encourage you to take advantage of those opportunities this week, every week, until the day that Christ returns. That's our job as followers of Christ. Build relationships. Act like you love Jesus. And then share the gospel. If they don't have a church home, we'd love to have them here. 